You talked earlier about uh, the friend who got you back on the on the cycle. Yeah. Um, what else have you learned and do you try to impart to people that you counsel about uh, developing a network of supportive relationships that you need to, to be successful? Right. I, I mean, I'm a big believer in, in this concept of the team, that the most important thing you can do in a startup or any organization is mm -hmm. about people. And yes, there's an element of hiring and engaging the team if you're the CEO that works on the team. But I'm a big believer that your team extends far more wide than just the people that are mm -hmm. in your organization. And I was really fortunate that I have always had some good mentors, uh, people either officially or unofficially, that I would reach out to and ask for help. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I had um, uh, on the board of my last two companies the former CFO from Bank of America. Mm -hmm. You're probably thinking, you know, why is this gray-haired guy who was part of this massive organization helping in a startup? Well, it turns out he was a really great guy to think about operational complexities that he had to deal with on a much greater scale that absolutely applied mm -hmm. to being a startup. Now, he also had, tends to be a very exceptional guy who can think about life in a startup. But you know, here was this, this guy who was the person I would turn to when I wanted a voice on our board of directors mm -hmm. that I could use as a sounding board and someone that we could spend two or three hours together bouncing ideas off in a very safe way. Mm -hmm. um, because especially as a CEO, it's a very lonely job. It's a lonely job because you've got this whole company of people that are looking to you as the leader. And you don't want to ever you know, seem like you're not sure or you don't know the answers. You've got a board of directors, typically of investors, that are giving you millions of dollars. The last thing you would do is show they up. They don't want to see your doubt. Right. You don't want to show up to them and say, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, talk about a career limiting move. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's one of them. And so having a set of people mm -hmm. that you can turn to for help, guidance, coaching, and advice mm -hmm. is a really, really powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and building that network, I think, helps you make you much more successful because it's you know, people that you can, can interact with and share very intimate things. And it's not just, by the way, in professional life. It could be sure. in all areas. I mean, every good athlete has a great coach. Mm -hmm. I mean, find me an athlete doesn't have a great coach. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan, I mean, the coach of the Bulls, He's legendary. Lance Armstrong had this guy, Chris Carmichael. He's his phenomenal coach. Um, Tiger Woods, he's got his great coaches. Mm -hmm. Every single athlete has a great coach. So why don't we think about that in our professional lives? Who is your great coach? And having that person as your great coach makes a big, in my opinion, makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. The economic news uh, of the day is, uh, is just continually depressing, and increasingly so. Uh, what thoughts do you have about what it's going to take for uh, young entrepreneurs to be successful uh, given you know, the very challenging economic environment that we're, that we're currently facing? Yeah, it's definitely a challenge, clearly. Um, y you know, um, and it sort of depends on the this, this state of where you are in terms of being an entrepreneur. Uh, if you're thinking about starting a company now, I'm actually very bullish on hmm. starting a company now. And that's actually the typical reaction. People go, hmm, what do you, how could Why you be bullish? Yeah. There's, there's very little money in the <laughs> venture capital market. Mm -hmm. uh, but please continue. What, what leads you to your optimism? Uh, one is history, two is experience, and, and three is sort of the reasons for why those things have worked. Number one, uh, if you look historically, some of the best companies have been started in downturns. Mm -hmm. Microsoft and Apple in the late 70s, Cisco in the mid to late 80s, Mm -hmm. Horrible time. Google really took off after the whole dot com implosion. Mm -hmm. And so the question is why, you know, why is that a good time to start? Well, what happens when there's a boom time is there's a lot more competition for everything. Mm -hmm. It starts with capital. If you're trying to raise money, when times are good, if you get funded with a good idea, there's going to be 10 or 20 other companies that get funded to do the same exact thing. When we started Vontu, mm -hmm. we started late 2001, it was not a very good time to raise money. And we raised money. There was really no company that got funded until almost 18 months after we were funded hmm. to, do, to compete with us. Hmm. And we were already now 18 months ahead. 
So it's a great time to start because if you can get capital, it's a competitive advantage. Second reason is because it's easier, it's never easy, but it's easier to hire great people. Mm. Because there are fewer great opportunities. So mm -hmm. if you have a great opportunity, it's a buyer's market in the labor market. On, on some on some level, it's 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 a buyer's market. Yeah, um, it's easier to recruit people out of companies that are unhappy. Mm -hmm. People are looking for new and exciting things, and so it's easier to hire great people. And then all the other mm -hmm. resources around a company too are easier. Whether it's simple things like lawyers and PR firms and mm -hmm. real estate are less expensive. They're and hungrier. Firm. And then the third thing I'm a big believer is, look, the, the economy will turn around. Mm -hmm. It always has for hundreds and hundreds of years. It might not be in 12 months. It might be in 24 or 36 months. But if you're smart about how you manage it, mm -hmm. you're getting in at the beginning of an economic cycle. Mm -hmm. And now you've got the wind at your back mm -hmm. for the next five to ten years of this next cycle to grow the company. Mm -hmm. And it's way easier to be accelerating your growth when you're taking advantage of an upswing in the economic mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you're starting, for those, for those reasons, I think now is a great time to start. It's scary. You've got to make sure you love what you're doing, and you're going to have to be ready to deal with a lot of challenges, and it's not going to be easy. But there are actually some benefits to being a startup mm. today that, that I actually like. Hmm. We're about to uh, conclude here. And before we do, I wanted to get some thoughts from you about uh, the future. So two aspects of that. One. Your future, how are you, what's, what's the next five-year horizon uh, right. look like as you're seeing it today? Uh, and, well, then I'll ask you the other question sure. I have in mind. So what are you thinking about for the next phase? Um, still working through it, to be honest. Um, but my, uh, my inkling is really to focus on a couple of things. Um, one is clearly continue to invest in my personal life and my relationship that I have and continue to develop and grow that on, on my personal, personal life. Um, the second is to continue to invest in my community, uh, clearly staying involved here at Wharton, but also there's a uh, homeless uh, nonprofit that I'm on the board of in San Francisco focused mm -hmm. on mostly homeless women and homeless pregnant women and families and how do you help mm -hmm. them give birth to healthy children and get them into housing and spending a lot of time on that because mm -hmm. poverty is such a big challenge that we face in this country. Um, and then professionally, um, to be honest, actually trying to be a bit of that coach that I talked about. Mm -hmm. Having been through three startups myself, having seen a lot of the challenges that occur, working with some of the venture capital community to find three or four companies that has a maybe a first time or a young entrepreneur who's sort of never been through that cycle mm -hmm. to help to be that coach mm -hmm. and to be an active person to help them roll up, the, roll up my sleeves a little mm -hmm. bit and, and help them through that, which I think will be fulfilling for me mm -hmm. and hopefully uh, something that they would uh, appreciate and value as well. Well, so uh, some of our uh, viewers are going to be people just like that. Uh, what would you say to, uh, to someone who's thinking about starting something new as like the most important, if you could distill it to, you know, one most essential idea uh, or principle, whether they're young or old, mm -hmm. starting something new. What, what do you think is the, the most important thing that people need to have in mind yeah. to I'm be a, successful? I'm a big believer in threes. So I'll, I'll, sort of, I'll get two, three okay. things that are important. Um, first is absolutely this concept, as we talked about before, of this, you have to approach this as a marathon. Mm -hmm. And you've you're, you're got, you got to think about how to get to the end game and be there for the next 10 years. So make sure you have the right plan and set the right pace. The second one is it's about leadership. And leadership starts with you. And it starts with you having a plan for yourself and then having a plan for what you're trying to do. And my definition of a leader is somebody with followers. And so your job is to figure out how to have the most engaged followers mm -hmm. that you, you can get. And that engagement means thinking about the other things that are important to them. Um, and, and then the third thing I would, I would add is make sure you love what you're doing because it's that passion. If mm -hmm. you're doing a startup, when the times get tough, and they always do, if you love it, it's going to get you through that process. So finding that thing that you love to do and all the things you love to do and figuring out how to optimize them in your work life and in your personal life and in your community Finding that passion, that love is going to get you through all the really 
tough things that are going to happen in, in, in starting a company. I, I get asked a lot the, the question, particularly of young, from young people, well, what if I don't know what I love? What, do you, what would you say in response to that question? Don't stop looking for it. Mm -hmm. You'll know when you find it. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to find it. I mean, I, I remember actually when I was interviewing when I was an undergrad, a large corporation I'm down in whatever the campus uh, recruiting offices are, and, and the interviewer asked me a question. He said, where do you want to be in 10 years? And I was 22 years old. I was just worried about where I was going to be that night for dinner. I mean, I, you know, and, and who I was going to meet for, for drinks, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I said something back to the person, which um, in, in a lot of ways was, was uh, it, my response back was, I said, did you think 10 years ago you'd be sitting here asking me that question? Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, it was, it was, it was, it, it's some truth to that, which is it's mm -hmm. really hard to know the specifics of where you're going to be mm -hmm. 10 years from now. But I think the important thing is to sit down and say, what are the things that matter to me? Mm -hmm. The big things. What are the three or four or five things that are most important to me? Mm -hmm. And that'll help you find the things that you love. And you're probably not going to find it right away. But you have to keep searching. And you shouldn't settle. Don't settle. That's probably the other key thing is it's really easy to settle and just say, well, I don't love what I do and I'm stuck. You're never stuck. So just... I, I get asked a lot the, the question, particularly of young, from young people, well, what if I don't know what I love? What, do you, what would you say in response to that question? Don't stop looking for it. Mm -hmm. You'll know when you find it. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to find it. I mean, I, I remember actually when I was interviewing when I was an undergrad, a large corporation I'm down in whatever the campus uh, recruiting offices are, and, and the interviewer asked me a question. He said, where do you want to be in 10 years? And I was 22 years old. I was just worried about where I was going to be that night for dinner. I mean, I, you know, and, and who I was going to meet for, for drinks, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I said something back to the person, which um, in, in a lot of ways was, was uh, it, my response back was, I said, did you think 10 years ago you'd be sitting here asking me that question? Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, it was, it was, it was, it, it's some truth to that, which is it's mm -hmm. really hard to know the specifics of where you're going to be mm -hmm. 10 years from now. But I think the important thing is to sit down and say, what are the things that matter to me? Mm -hmm. The big things. What are the three or four or five things that are most important to me? Mm -hmm. And that'll help you find the things that you love. And you're probably not going to find it right away. But you have to keep searching. And you shouldn't settle. Don't settle. That's probably the other key thing is it's really easy to settle and just say, well, I don't love what I do and I'm stuck. You're never stuck. So just keep looking for it. Don't settle. Try new things and experiment. And eventually you'll find it. On that note, uh, I'm going to draw us to a close. And thank you again, Joseph, for joining me and our viewers uh, this afternoon. It's been great speaking with you and catching up with you. Um, really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, thank you all for listening.